I'm going to get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Farah. Uh, welcome to the July webinar for the Access and Benefit Sharing um, Clearinghouse webinar series. So this month we're doing it on the Kunming uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and Access and Benefit Sharing, especially in relation to Goal C and Target 13. Um, so this a bit about the series. This is a monthly webinar series that the ABS team does where we focus on different topics as it relates to the ABS Clearinghouse. Um, and then after the webinar, you're going to get answers to the questions um, through this webinar. We're also going to post a recording of this on YouTube. And also we're going to reach out uh, with the FAQs later on with the answers. Um, I will let you know that we've had an huge, we've had a huge interest in this webinar this month. So we've had to cut down the questions and we're going to be prioritizing the questions that focus on especially goal C and target 13. So right now I'm going to pass it off to my coworkers to introduce themselves. I'll start with Beatrice if you want to go ahead. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome to this webinar. As uh, Farah said, it has, um, there is a lot of interest, so we will probably try to continue working on this topic uh, to fulfill your interest and answer all your questions. Uh, my name is Beatriz Gomez and I work on the ABS unit, uh, particularly on assessment and review and national reports. And now I'm going to pass the floor maybe to Regina to introduce herself. Good morning, my name is Regina, or good morning, afternoon, and so on. Uh, I work uh, as a program assistant in the ABS unit, um, supporting different areas within the unit. Um, I pass to Jillian, please. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Jillian Campbell. I lead the work of the um, Convention on Biological Diversity Secretariat on monitoring, review, and reporting. Hi, I'll jump in here. My name is Alexandra Coelho, and I also am a program assistant with the ABS team at the Secretariat, uh, working specifically some of the time on DSI. And back to you, Far. All right, thank you everyone for the introductions. So we do have a lot of people coming in and going, so please pardon those lobby noises. I don't know if you can hear them. So just a quick agenda, this is a one hour webinar, but we do expect it to go a bit over, uh, but don't feel, feel the pressure to stay because there will be the recording after, like I mentioned. So we will answer these questions in clusters and we're gonna prioritize the questions that focus on target 13 and goal C. So with that being said, um, this is just like a quick overview of target 13 and goal C. So target 13 is unfair and equitable sharing of benefits from genetic resources, digital sequ sequence information and associated traditional knowledge. And you can find the goal, um, the quick guide just on this link. And then we also have the 2050 goals, a link for that. And we'll be sharing that in the chat. So who's here? When I did this overview, we had 169 people registered. Um, most of them are government representatives, but you can also see the breakdown of groups we have people from research institutions, from businesses, from um, NGOs. And then we also have a regional breakdown where we have uh, people from Eastern Europe. We also have Africa, Asia Pacific, uh, Western Europe and other groups and um, Latin American Caribbean represented in this webinar, which is great to see. With that being said, I'll pass it on to Jillian for the next slide. So um, I believe probably most people on this call have heard of the COP15 meeting and the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, as you likely know, this was adopted in Montreal in 2022. There was a long process leading up to the adoption of this framework um, and a lot of global attention. The, the COP was attended by more than 15,000 people. Um, in, in some capacity, or that was the number of registered participants anyway. And this represents an agreement from all countries to 
work towards achieving four different goals, which two, one of them was just presented. These four goals are up until 2050. And then there's 23 action targets, which represent different actions that countries have agreed to take up to 2030 towards the achievement of those goals. Um, and so the, there's also reporting that happens on these and it's a legal obligation under the convention. So countries do take their obligation really seriously because once they have agreed to the framework, they also are responsible for making plans towards it and reporting against it. I, I think I'll leave it at that and back to you. So now we're moving to um, talk about goal C. The questions received here uh, are mainly concerned with the benefit sharing aspect and equity. Um, I think it's important to say that um, we all want to see the benefits shared, which is why goal C has been included as one of the four goals of the global biodiversity framework. And as you all know, the ABS is enshrined in the third objective of the convention, and equity was actually the central principle driving negotiations of the CBD provisions on ABS at the time. Now, more than two decades after the adoption of the convention, the ABS uh, principles are actually more relevant than ever. And um, these principles of equity and fairness are being incorporated in different international forums, um, as you will also hear throughout the webinar. Um, so with inclusion of Goal C in the GBF and also Target 13, um, ABS is again at the core of the discussions on biodiversity and its vision for 2050 and the mission for 2030. So I'd like to uh, just explain Goal C um, and its components. Um, Goal C addresses monetary and non-monetary benefits from the utilization of genetic resources and digital sequence information on genetic resources and also traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources uh, shared in accordance with internationally agreed ABS instruments. So Goal C includes several components um, or criteria for success, which is benefits are substantially increased by 2050 Benefits are shared fairly and equitably, including as appropriate indigenous peoples and local communities. Benefits need to ensure that the traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources is appropriately, appropriately protected and benefits contribute to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Um, the goal C is directly linked to target 13 and they should be looked at closely together. So the target 13 actually expresses the actions that needed to be taken to reach the goal, which brings me to the next set of questions. So this is, uh, yeah, this was the short version of that. So anyways, here are the next questions. And um, I think we can um, move directly to the next slide. Um, the questions are, um, the overarching questions regarding target 13 is what actually does the target 13 bring in practice? So I will not read out the full target. Uh, you have the long and short version on the screen. And before I start explaining the target or breaking down the target and its elements. Um, uh, Fada, please, can you go back? Uh, this isn't the wrong slide. Yeah. And one, yeah. This one? Yeah. Um, so what's new about the target? So first of all, the scope of the target has increased. Now it, it goes much further than the previous IG target 16, which only covered the Nagoya protocol. Target 13 of the global biodiversity framework includes DSI. It includes ABS under the convention and ABS under other international instruments. Um, so this because of this, um, Target 13 raises the awareness uh, internationally on ABS, especially with the inclusion of DSI and also the other a international ABS instruments. And it also brings new, new players into the game, which also offers new opportunities. Um, so now I would, I'm going to break down the target so we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, you will see this is a screenshot of the explanation of the target and its elements as it's contained in the quick guide that was mentioned earlier. Um, so target 13 has two main components. First, it's putting in place legal policy and administrative measures of ABS. And secondly, it's putting in place capacity building measures for ABS. 
The first part has two subcomponents. So it's to the need to take effective ABS legal policy and administrative measures in accordance with international ABS instruments. So there are two components. First is a quantitative, having measures in place, and a qualitative aspect, which is that the measures are supposed to be effective. So to achieve those measures, is it, so measures need to be in place to ensure benefit sharing and as well facilitate the access to genetic resources. Otherwise, they, there are no benefits flowing. Um, the second part, the capacity building measures, recognizes the need to build capacity of, on ABS on all levels, so the objective of the target can be achieved. Um, this also includes capacity building measures on DSI and associated traditional knowledge. Um, so I will talk about different decisions and processes related to capacity building uh, later on during the webinar. Um, but for now, I would like to hand over uh, to my colleague for the next slide. Hello. So um, here um, I'm going to answer some of the questions that are more related with the challenges, uh, the challenges in implementing ABS and some of the questions, philosophical questions we are having with the ABS systems. And also what our opportunities are bringing with the global biodiversity framework. So, for example, as you can see, the two first questions are about uh, trying to understand what are the challenges uh, on ABS. So for this, uh, there is plenty of information that you can refer to if you want to understand better what is working, what is missing, what are the gaps and why. Uh, in Article 31 of the Nauea Protocol, establish a process to assess and review the effectiveness of the protocol. So we have a process to take a stock and understand better how, how the systems are working. The first evaluation, uh, we did it in 2018 and was done on the basis of all the information received in the interim national report, as well as other sources of information. So we did a very in-depth analysis of all the information we had. And uh, the conclusions of the process are reflected on the decision that was taken at COPMOP, that is uh, NP3-1. They are going to provide you the link. But uh, where it's provided more on a summary basis. The annex is maybe two or three pages that is very condensed, but has really big information. But for example, if you want to know more about understanding the challenges or the situation better, we prepare a few documents that were done for the consideration of COPMOP. And they are very useful. Uh, these documents are the key findings of the first assessment and review, so like a longer version of the outcomes. And also the analysis of information in the international report contains a wealth of information on how countries are doing to implement each of the provisions of the protocol, the problems, the misunderstandings, the examples, the case studies. So uh, there is a lot of information to, to help you okay, on the years to come. With the, um, with the implementation of the GBF and the target on ABS. Um, regarding the third question, how the targets and goals of the webinar will be implemented? Well, the implementation, uh, this is uh, happen at national level. So each country has to set a national target, have to do an analysis and uh, see what is the status, decide where do you want to go, like this is status, what do you want to achieve? What we can do better? As they were saying, um, Regina, there is a quantitative analysis and a quality, qualitative analysis. Is Are we doing it right? Um, and um, um, to do the MBSAPS is the instrument to do this, uh, this policy process and where you can take the opportunity to um, to to take a stock and continue working on this. Um, let me just a second. Uh, the next slide, please. Where this I think one? you moved too fast. This one? No, the previous. Yeah, thank you. Um, where? Here. <laughs> Sorry. It's good. Uh, the quick the quick guide uh, provides and some questions that can help you to guide the process at national level. So these questions, you have it there, you can refer to them uh, just to help the process. 
But um, the question is that uh, countries, um, as we were saying, they need to assess, you make wish to assess institutional structures necessary, all the measures in place to ensure that the sharing of benefits is happening for genetic resources and for associated traditional um, knowledge, and um, also to facilitate appropriate access. So you have the two components, sharing of benefits and appropriate access. Um, to do that, you need to assess if you're complying with all the obligations that you have contracted at international level for all international ABS instruments. And also to see if what I mean, because you can be complying, but maybe the measures are not effective. So uh, how do you see if the measures are effective? The main criteria is are the measures I have in place leading to the sharing of benefits? If they are not leading to sharing of benefits, maybe there is something that can be improved. What could it be? At national level, during the NVSA process, is uh, the first uh, national report for the Nagoya Protocol that has been adopted in the last COP. Of being introduced in the ABS Clearinghouse for uh, you will get a notification when it's ready for submission. So uh, the report is can be also used as a tool. I mean, besides an obligation, it's a tool to see all the obligations you have. It's a checklist and uh, do uh, uh, reflect on lessons learned and challenges. So you can maybe combine the two processes as well to make a, a solid analysis based on the national report and you comply with the obligation and help you in the MBSAP process. So all the questions that we have here, verify some of the questions we receive uh, from for the webinar, are applicable to all parties, independently that you are a user or a provider. So this, they all can work for both sides. And, and yeah, with this, I think I can pass to the next, next slide, please. Um, so here, there is a lot of questions also about how we make uh, this qualitative, I mean, about the qualitative aspects. Uh, there is a lot of questions about is ABS being effective? Is ABS leading to, uh, do we want this system? Do we think the system is working? And what is the future? As you can see when you read the questions. So for um, to answer uh, to answer this, um, basically we how we make ABS work for all for all involved countries, indigenous peoples, users of genetic resources it has to be uh, we have to make it happen because it holds a lot of potential, and I think we are all convinced because we still have it in the GBF and there is a political will. This, um, how we take the opportunity of the MBSAPs and the GBF to revamp the ABS systems and make it work. Inclusive and a participatory approach to the MBSAP uh, revision process is key. So you need to make sure that you have stakeholders, different users, indigenous peoples and local communities essential seated at the table. So you, with the, um, of all, the society, everybody involved, NGOs, women, youth, you envision where do you want to get with ABS and how we can make it uh, work. Also, this is the best also the way of making everybody participate in the process and in the vision for a, poli in a policy process is the best way of getting them engaged and make sure that they comply later on, also for the use from the user perspective. So um, there is, as I say there is two opportunities, very important opportunities to evaluate existing ABS systems. First, the evaluation of ABS at national level, at the country level, with the MBSAPs, uh, with the particip participatory process. A big framework, and from the past, is that we have gained a lot of experience. I mean, uh, ABS is not new anymore. There is ABS systems in place. There is a wealth of experience that you can even consult with the through publications and the interim national report and in the future, the first national report. So now we know more and I think we can do it better. And second, the other way of like trying to improve and, and go together in the same direction 
is uh, the um, participation at the international level. Collectively, all countries and all, all um, as a society, we can um, uh, influence international negotiations under the CBD and under other fora as well, international fora that are relevant for ABS, to, to go all in a step direction that can work and can really lead to the increase in benefit sharing. The assessment and review process, as I mentioned before, is another opportunity. There is a second assessment and review process uh, that mm, the methodology will be adopted in the next uh, COPMOP meeting and the outcomes uh, of the process and the analysis of the national reports. We will do the same thing. It's a good opportunity to take a stock and see if collectively we need to, to change something. We have to go more in one direction. And um, yeah, regarding the two questions, last questions, uh, what is the future of ABS and what transformative change? Well, the future of ABS um, and the transformative change will depend on you, on the countries, on the users, on the IPLCs, and as well as our collective work uh, together. So I don't hold the answer, you all hold the answer. <laughs> so with this, um, okay, uh, next slide, please, Farah. Um, there is questions about like guidance on how we can do ABS implementation. And a lot of uh, these questions, for example, are referring to a model, a one size fit all model for ABS. There is no such a standard ABS law. There is no such a <laughs> that model uh, that can apply to all countries. Um, there is guidance available. There is capacity building and development resource. I mean, there is resources, there is case studies, there is examples, but ultimately each country implements an AWIA protocol according to their national circumstances. And that's how you, I mean, how it has been decided. At international level, uh, you have the bond guidelines providing guidance um, on requirements for establishing an ABS system. So you have the AWIA protocol, of course, you have other international treaties. Uh, at regional level, there is some examples of regional coordination. So we have uh, like uh, the decision 391 of the Andean community. That is an example. You have the EU regulation that is very known as a regional coordination or the African Union guidelines. These are um, uh, regional approaches are very welcome and countries can decide to get together and go at a regional level to a more harmonized approach at regional and international level. This is something countries can always decide. Um, just reiterating that it's very important uh, to move all in the same direction. And this is something that users of genetic resources struggle with and doesn't, and they repeat like very often, that the difference of the different systems of ABS and going to a country and navigating a totally different approach, word in terminology is very confusing for them and very burdensome. So harmonization approaches of ABS are certainly welcome by the users particularly, and I think uh, could um, help many in many instances, but ultimately it's up to countries to move in that. Yeah, no, there is no uh, percentage universally agreed for ABS for the sharing of benefits. I understood that. Uh, it's up to countries and providers to negotiate uh, the percentage of the benefit sharing during the negotiations of the contract. So, Uh, here, there were some questions about specific resources, like I want to know more about this or about the other. As I said, there is a num number of resources available to understand the protocol, PIC, MAT, case studies, um, particularly regarding the last question. For example, I just want to say that there is about um, collecting experience from users. There is um, some organizations really working out with users to get that feedback from users with their experience with countries. And uh, this is, for example, UABT does that, uh, the German hub, Nagoya Protocol Hub does that as well, and the ABS Capacity Development Initiative has an initiative to try to, um, to get a more, um, yeah, more organized feedback from users on their experiences from countries. So there is something happening in this regard. Um, the next slide, please. Para? Yeah. So this is uh, just a link uh, again to the quick guide and the list of resources that you can find there that can help you. There is many things are already there and we don't need to repeat them. 
over and over again. So things that are very useful. The SIPA toolkit uh, that you have there, the link, contains very useful information, for example, for the MBSA process. It includes reference to materials developed by partners and useful resources on strategic communication. And these are organized in four goals. So there is for planning strategic communication and raising awareness. So this is very important for MBSA process. There is also uh, resources and links and a lot of step-by-step uh, -step, uh, information for fostering political will and engaging decision makers, so very key. And goal three uh, is about involving indigenous peoples and local communities and relevant stakeholders, so also very key for the MBSAP. And goal four uh, is more about communicating for successful partnerships, so more about dealing with mutually agreed terms and developing contracts. So there, for example, you can find answering the question about PIC, there you can find a lot of inf information about PIC and MAT. Also there we have um, the link to e-learning modules. And for instance, in particular for the MBSA process, there is uh, some e-learning modules that we prepare uh, on ABS measures, establishing ABS measures with IDLO. And there is one on legal reform and policy setting and supportive measures. I mean, there is three of them, uh, legal reform, policy setting and supportive measures that can be very useful for the MBSA revision as well. And where you have examples of how countries have been doing things step by step on policy setting, engaging with the stakeholders. So all of this is, is very fleshed out with very specific experience and, and lessons learned and best practices. So you can find the list of resources there and please use them uh, when, yeah, consult them. Everything is there. Sometimes we just don't know that it's there. So we use the opportunity to remind you. And with this, I'm going to, we are going to pass to Alexandra to talk about DSI that is also raising a lot of expectations and questions. Hi, uh, so on this slide, we received a few questions, quite a few questions on DSI and target 13. Uh, these included questions about scope, uh, capacity building and tech transfer, the details of how a multilateral system would work, um, etc. And basically the key to all these answers is in de decision 15.9 from COP15. If we go to the next slide. So decision 15.9 is establishes that the benefits resulting from the use of DSI have to be shared in a fair and equitable manner. But the DT and it also established a multilateral mechanism, including a global fund in order to implement this. So these two decisions were made. However, the details, the modalities, the mechanism of the fund have not yet been decided. And decision 59 included a process on how parties were going to do this. And this is during this interse intercessional period. So the, the final decision is set to be done at COP16 in 2024. Um, so if we, we see here decision 59, this is what they agreed, that the genetic resources should be shared fairly and equitably, and that it would be a multilateral system as opposed to a bilateral system, which is the one included in the Nagoya Protocol. Also, decision 59 is part of the convention as a whole. We could go to the next slide. So, this is the process that was agreed upon. It includes two studies. One is a compilation of lessons learned from other international funds and a synthesis of views that parties and stakeholders submitted earlier this year that is already underway. Additionally, there's an ad hoc. Um, yeah. So these studies are in the process right now. We don't have the results of the studies at the moment. They're going to be presented at, during the working groups. So additionally, there are two ad hoc open-ended working groups on benefit sharing from the use of DSI. These were established and will meet, the first one will meet from the 14th to the 18th of November in Geneva, Switzerland this year. And the second meeting will take place next year in 2024. Um, these upcoming, this upcoming meeting will consider an, a, a list of issues that were determined in the annex of decision 15.9 
for which I had mentioned there was already a submission of views, and then they would be further discussed during the working group. The mandate of the working group is to consider the studies and other work and in, as inputs and to undertake further development of this multilateral mechanism and to make recommendations to the conference of the party at its 16th meeting. Uh, so how do you, there was a question, how do we get involved? How, uh, how do you participate? Well, we invite all those who wish to participate in this meeting to attend the meeting in Geneva or to liaise with government representatives or stakeholder representatives who will attend, and that is the best way to participate. We'll share in the, in the chat a link of the submission of views that was already made earlier this year and a link to the documents for the meeting. Next slide. So this is the list of issues contained in the annex that will be discussed during the working group. A lot of them relate to questions that you sent in for today's webinar, such as the triggering point for benefit sharing, the potential to vol voluntarily extend the multilateral system for all genetic resources, the disimbursement process, capacity development and technology transfer, the relationship with the Nagoya Protocol, the role, rights, and interests of indigenous peoples and, and local communities associated with traditional knowledge. These are all issues that still need to be discussed and um, agreed upon, so we don't have any question, any answers at the moment on how it will work. But watch this space for what's coming in the next two years. Next slide. Then we also had some questions on DSI and coordinating with other international instruments. So for the collaboration, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, and the BBNJ, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Biological Diversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction, have uh, all formally called for cooperation between the international instruments and capacity building on DSI. As seen in the previous slide, in the annex to uh, decision 59, capacity developments, technology transfer, monitoring, adaptability, all these questions are still under negotiation and will be taken up during the working group. Again, in order to get involved, you can communicate with party delegates and stakeholder representatives. The secretariats of all of these relevant treaties are in close communications and facilitate the sharing of information among the different forums. So that's how that's happening. Now I will pass to my colleague Farah for the next question. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. So the next set of questions are on the role of stakeholders, um, such as research and business community. So implementing target 13, um, it's a whole of society approach and stakeholders such as research and business communities, uh, academia, NGOs, youth, women groups, uh, they need to continue participation at different levels than ABS implementation. So research and business communities can contribute by complying with ABS laws and making sure that the benefits are being shared in accordance to the PIC and MAT that was um, established. So they can also contribute by engaging in decision-making and policy development uh, to make sure that ABS developments at the national levels, they're accounting for the user perspective because without the engagement of users, there will be no benefit sharing. Um, they can also do so by engaging with user associations and organizations like Bea mentioned previously, and also through promoting ABS compliance and awareness. This could um, include as well the development and implementation of model clauses codes of conduct, guidelines, and you can look at the ABS Clearinghouse for tools that have already been developed and uploaded. So the NBSAP revision process is also a very, um, an excellent opportunity to make sure that the stakeholders are participating and are part of the ABS vision for the country. And all these levels of engagement and participation are key to ensure that the users are following ABS requirements. So like I'm going to mention the SEPA toolkit again that Bea mentioned. It's a 
great resource um, for everyone. So you can go back to the chat to find that. So the next is on roll up IPLCs, which is also very similar to the previous slide. So they have a particular role to play in the implementation of ABS as they are the right holders of associated traditional knowledge. And um, this is reflected in goal C. So one of the outcomes of the first assessment and review process is that the implementation of the IPLC's related provisions is still lagging behind. Countries need to ensure that they comply with their obligations related to IPLCs while ensuring that the full and effective participation of IPLCs and um, there's full and effective participation in all levels of ABS processes. So IPLCs can participate in ABS by engaging in decision making and policy development to make sure that um, their rights and perspectives are taken into account at national and international levels. Um, they can also engage with IPLC organization and raise awareness of IPLC issues. They can also develop community protocols and publish the information on the ABS Clearinghouse. Again, you can refer to the ABS Clearinghouse for uh, community yeah. protocols and procedures that have already been published. And um, yeah, like again, like participate in the NVSAP revision process. Um, and then also refer to the SEPA toolkit. There's also another resource, it's the Aquicon, the Voluntary Guidelines by the CBD. It includes, um, it's for the conduct of cultural, environmental, and social impact assessment regarding developments proposed to take place on or which are likely to impact on sacred sites and on lands and waters traditionally occupied or used by Indigenous and local communities. So these guidelines they include possible steps, general considerations and guidance on ways and means to ensure the effective participation of indigenous peoples in local communities. And the guidelines are just posted. And then I will just pass this to the next person. So now um, on the slide, you will find questions uh, that were received in relation to capacity building and financial support, how, um, what will happen on this end to support the implementation of Target 13 and Goal C? Um, we can move to the next slide directly, please. Um, I want to answer this, uh, that um, there was a whole package of related decisions uh, adopted at COP in December together with the GBF. Uh, which um, will answer all these questions. So there's, uh, first of all, decision 15 slash 8 on capacity building and development and technical and scientific cooperation, which includes in its annex um, a long term strategic framework for capacity building and development, which is to support the national priorities for implementation of the GBF. This uh, long term framework outlines expected high level capacity results. It provides a menu for guiding principles and key strategies and approaches on how to design, implement and monitor capacity building and development initiatives. It's it's a very good resource and um, we can share the link also in the chat. It, um, it's useful for everyone to take a look, I would think. Um, a part of this long-term strategic framework, um, they call for uh, action plans on thematic areas. So as under the Nagoya protocol, the COPMOP actually mandated the executive secretary to raise the existing strategic framework for capacity building to support the implementation of the Nagoya protocol. So currently a new action plan for capacity development um, under the Nagoya protocol is being developed and it will be submitted to SBI for consideration and then later to COPMAP um, in 2024. And this would be considered as one of the thematic action plans under the long-term strategic framework. Um, also, there were there was a question on technical and scientific cooperation, so I want to mention this quickly as well. Uh, this is also part of the decision 15 slash 8. The, um, a process was established uh, on this issue, including an advisory group um, that is uh, looking at practical measures, tools, opportunities to promote um, technical and, sci uh, and scientific cooperation. And similar to there, there is actually a website with a lot of resourceful uh, information that uh, we'll also share in the chat. 
In addition to the capacity building part, the COP15 adopted decision 15 slash 7 on the uh, on resource mobilization and um, of course mobilization of adequate financial resources is key to the successful implementation of the of the global biodiversity framework and um, so in this decision there is a there was established a fund that is um, established under the jeff and in the last council meeting which took place in june um, the the Jeff's governing board approved the plans for the establishment of the fund. So all this is happening right now. So now we're just expecting, we're waiting to know how much money will be in that fund. So hopefully there will be some exciting news. In addition to this, as you all know, the financing instrument under the CBD is the Jeff Eight is the Jeff, and the Jeff Eight programming um, direction um, programming directions include uh, the Nagur Protocol um, as objectives. So we can also share the link on that. You can see directly the areas that are going to be supported by Jeff Eight. And um, just to give you a number um, for the aid replenishment, 82 million US dollars um, have been allocated to implement both protocols under the conventions. So the Katakina Protocol and the Nagara Protocol. Um, so this is for that. Now, uh, please move to the next slide. Um, just a last sentence on this, because all these uh, decisions provide essentially international guidance, uh, but countries need to make the effort to translate this in to, to get adapted to the national level. And uh, part of this will be basically done through their NBSAP provision and national target setting processes. So there is guidance from COP also that encourages the parties to develop national uh, finance plans for resource mobilization, as well as national capacity building plans based on the on needs assessment. Um, and um, we would like to encourage, um, for example, that all ABS national focal points get in touch with their GEF or um, CBD national focal points to coordinate the process to make sure that target 13 is adequately represented in the process. And um, there is already, um, I mentioned some resources on the slide, um, a lot of things happening. There is the NBSAP Accelerator Partnership, which is Basically, each, in each country, there will be um, a project on this. And then there's the Jeff Early Action Support where um, they can apply for funds. And um, I don't know if you've heard about that. There's the NBSAP Forum, which is linked on the slide, which is a, it's, provides a lot of uh, useful resources on, on NBSAPs in general. Um, so yeah, with this, I would like to pass on to my colleague for the next slide, Beatrice. Yeah, so now I'm going to answer some of the questions that were more related to the relationship of Target 13 with other international ABS instruments. As uh, my colleague explained at the beginning, uh, Target 13 ap uh, applies to ABS according to all applicable international ABS instruments. But the list of the instruments that are included were, are not provided in the target. Uh, so what we have done is to interpret, look at the, the indicators, the existing indicators, and for the moment we are understanding that the target covers ABS under the CBD. That cannot be forgotten because sometimes we always think about the Nagoya Protocol, but no, there is ABS obligations under the CBD and parties to parties that haven't signed ratified the Nagoya Protocol have still these obligations. Uh, the Nagoya Protocol and the International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. However, the target can include other instruments as they may be adopted. So this is the case, for example, of, uh, as the question uh, actually also says, um, of the, uh, in June this year, uh, an agreement under the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Love of the Sea, uh, was adopted on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the treaty contains benefit sharing obligations for both marine genetic resources and also for DSI. 
it to be decided uh, upon by the COP of the next treaty. So it's still work in progress. Now it's uh, has been adopted. So the first stage would be a step would be to um, ratify countries may wish to consider ratifying the instrument, and after <laughs> the machine will start. So, um, the, for example, the quick the quick guide is being reviewed uh, to incorporate this new development. And I just also want to say that the quick guide is something that is going to be up to date, and we will be revised to incorporate uh, to do little corrections or to incorporate new developments as they may happen. So, what does it mean in practice? Uh, this that the fact that the target includes these instruments as well. First means that parties may wish to consider ratifying all relevant international ABS agreements. So that would be something that they would be put in the table for your consideration of the country, and that it can be considered as part of the target setting and policy process of the MBSAP, as we were saying. So when you discuss the MBSAP, you're not only discussing NAWIA protocol or ABS under the convention, you also are discussing other instruments. Um, parties to the different ABS related international instruments need to take policy and administrative measures to implement them. So when you are um, looking at what do you need to do, you need to do analysis for uh, the NAWIA protocol, but you also need to do analysis for the International Treaty of Plant Genetic Resources or for ABS under the convention, and in the future maybe, uh, as we say, other instruments. And so this is also a great opportunity. So when you are doing this visa process, is so what we're putting a lot of emphasis of using the opportunity to do many things and to improve many things in the country. So it's an opportunity to improve like national coherence in implementation of different international instruments that sometimes they go in different ministries or they are under different um, responsibilities and make sure that they are implemented nationally in a coherent manner and in a mutual supportive manner. So again, a good opportunity to increase communication, not only by not only for the little APS wall of the NAWIA protocol, but beyond that, and include other users and include in IPLCs. So um, there is also some questions here about the pandemic influenza preparedness framework for the sharing of influenza viruses and access to vaccines and other benefits. What is known by the PIP framework, in short, of the WHO, and um, Sorry, I'm having um, and it's um, it's important to note uh, because the question talks about MEA's agreements that this instrument uh, is um, is um, a public health instrument, not a multilateral environment agreement. So we are talking about different things. It's not um, part of an MEA. It's also a voluntary agreement. It's non legally binding. So this is different, for example, for the CBD, the Naga Protocol and International Treaty, that they are legally binding instruments. So they have another status. Um, it's true that there is also ongoing negotiations happening at WHO for extending uh, this PIP framework to other um, viruses and for pandemic, another wider pandemic treaty that is not just the influenza viruses, but dealing with other viruses and that uh, might be legally binding and may include as well ABS considerations. This is still under negotiation. Um, there is also some questions about intellectual property. Uh, intellectual property considerations are now are being considered under WIPO, under the World International Property Organization. Uh, there is an intergovernmental committee on intellectual property and genetic resources and traditional knowledge and folklore. They have been negotiating this treaty for some time. It's now having a boost, so we might have a treaty very soon. And once that uh, this happens, we might need to also consider how this relates to Target 13. Um, what I want to say here, just as a remark, um, that including international ABS instruments under Target 13 and Goal C has implications. So it's not just a matter of like interpretation or like um, we need to think it through because um, for, for instance, once I mean, like what are the implications if we consider that the PIP framework is included under under the target? And does it make it, for example, that is eligible for GF funding or the Kunming fund? And 
Can we, for example, justify that the exchange of viruses contributes to biodiversity goals? I mean, are they related? The fact that there is ABS considerations, should it be there? Should it be covered by the NBSAP? And should we report to the implementation of to see what is included, given that um, at the moment of the negotiation, there was not a list. The indicators were uh, only referred to the instruments I was saying, international treaty, the CBD, and, and the Nagoya Protocol. So, but um, as it happens and they get adopted, we will have to have this consideration and, and, and see the relevance to include interpreted as, as part of the target thing. So how we can make sure that all of this that is happening is aligned? Uh, well, the two ways. At secretariat level, we secretariat. So we facilitate cooperation and coordination, and we report to each other. We exchange information informally and formally. And you can see, for example, uh, what we have been done and some reflection of these developments that relate Mop on cooperation and the last document, for example, provides some of the information that we do, what we do at the secretarial level and what is happening in the international forum that is important to us um, at the policy international policy level. But of course, countries need to make sure there is a coherence in policy developments on international level. So you need to talk to the people that is negotiating these treaties to make sure that we are not doing two different things. And as we say, we all advance in the same direction. Oh, you have been signed out. <laughs> Give me one yeah, second. Well, it happens. It's, it's just a system. Um, uh, don't worry. Uh, so, um, what I wanted to say about the ABS international instruments, and like now we were going to pass maybe to um, indicators. So maybe Gillian, you can just introduce yourself and start talking about indicators because also this is a since. We are very lucky to have Gillian here. She's our expert and a very busy person, and she's doing an amazing job making sense of everything. So, please, Gillian. So, yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the the GBF, there were indicators that were adopted along with the goals and the targets of the framework, and so um, these indicators were adopted even if some of them require further methodological work, but it was an agreement by parties that we need to have data to, to monitor the goals and the targets. Um, there's different kinds of indicators that were adopted. There was the headline indicators, which will be included in the national reporting template for all countries to complete. Um, there's the binary type indicators. These are questions that again will be included in the national reporting template for all countries to report. So those two levels of indicators are sort of part of the, the mandatory or almost, you know, not mandatory, but the um, template for national reporting. And, and we are expecting that all countries will complete this. Um, and then there's other component complementary indicators, which are indicators that um, will be useful for many, many countries to include in their NBSAP process. Um, they provide additional details on uh, on the goals and the targets, um, and they might be useful also for global review when we when we do the assessment of progress. Um, so in terms of goal C, there were two indicators that were adopted, and neither one of them have a methodology, as some of you would probably know. Um, these two indicators are the, an indicator on monetary benefits and an indicator on non-monetary benefits, so an actual quantification of those two aspects. Uh, this is something that we at the Secretariat are working with many partners to try to figure out how we can operationalize, and there's also a technical expert group that has been established to, to try to take this work forward. Um, and then there's a number of other there's a, also a, a binary indicator that was adopted on target 13, and this would aim to ask questions about the, um, the policies and the frameworks that countries have in place in order to ensure that ABS is fair and equitably shared. So those are the, the types of indicators. So as I said, there's uh, 
I think a very these two indicators mentioned here are very important. Also, the indicator on target 13 is, is very, very important because this will provide the other side. So the indicators on the monetary benefits will provide a quantification of the outcome, whereas the questions on target 13 for the binary indicator would ask direct questions, not um, quantitative information, but qualitative information on, on policies that exist. Um, and, and so this is how we're we're developing this. And um, as as mentioned, this work is not ready. It's still very much in in process. Um, and it, it's something that I think we would maybe have some follow up discussions on. Um, I can add, allow that ABS team to talk about this, but um, I think we might have some follow up discussions as this work moves forward on how we can actually monitor these and provide you some information on what this looks like as we get a little bit closer down the line to, to having a full methodology here. Um, then I think that I, I want to go to the next slide and then maybe even the next slide after that. Um, is this? Yeah, this one. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, in terms of the monetary benefits and the non-monetary benefits, uh, uh, we're still doing methodological research, but we are trying to pull out this information. There's been a number of different areas that we have looked at. For instance, on the non-monetary benefits, you can try to look at research publications, but again, this is one snippet of information. Um, you can pull out some of the monetary benefits out of different ABS permit systems, um, but perhaps this is uh, is not going to give you the full information that you want. And, and also in terms of how do we understand the this aspect of fair and equitable sharing of benefits, this is certainly another um, part of the methodology that I think we need to look at. And um, I mean, I think all the questions that have been asked that were sent to us are also questions basically that we are asking as we try to take this methodology forward. Um, and, and so if you see the questions that are on the screen and we can go to the to the next slide also on questions. Um, then you can see, I mean, there are a lot of questions that people have here. Um, currently, we are we're not focusing so much on the on DSI as this is an area I think that we're just trying to get going. Um, and so that is something that will be included as a linkage in the work that we're doing. However, we would expect that um, under the discussions on DSI, including the ones that will happen in Geneva later this year, there would be some discussion there that would help us move forward in terms of measuring DSI. Um, and then I wanted to say on the indicator for target 13. Um, I, I think that it's it's really useful to understand what measures exist, but we are trying to design it. So, I mean, if you consider some countries where they have decided that they will not have legislation on um, on access, I know some European countries would not necessarily have both aspects of the access and benefit sharing. And so then how do you actually um, capture these countries in, in the questions? And this is something that we're talking about now, but we haven't really figured out a conclusion on this yet. Um, and it, it will be something that we certainly will share with all parties at, at, as it evolves. Um, and then the, the next question that is on the relationship between the GBF and the SDGs, um, it is true that the target 13 has a similar structure to uh, the, the indicator on target 13 has a similar structure to SDG 15.6. Um, SDG 15.6 does have, if you look at the methodology for that indicator, it really does focus heavily on who is a, a party to what convention. So it looks at who's a, or not convention, but protocol or agreement. So um, one of the parts of this is, are you a party to the um, Nagoya protocol or are you a member of the um, plant treaty? And again, I mean, I think this is perhaps not the 
exact purpose of the target. And so we're trying to figure out the best wording of these binary indicators in order to also get us a, a good indicator for target 13 that actually is asking um, all parties, whether they are a, a party to the protocol or not, what they are doing in terms of ABS. Um, so I think maybe I will leave it at this and hand back over to Beatrice. Maybe she would also like to follow up some points on the indicators and then um, talk about the clearinghouse. Thanks. Hello. Um, yeah, I think you explained it very well. I mean, it's working process uh, for the indicators, and I hope during that process we will clarify some of these remaining also like open questions. We will, as uh, Gillian said, and we are going to work on preparing some studies and there will be opportunities for all the ABS community to engage maybe during webinars, also side events. So we will we will um, keep you informed of uh, the possibilities for measuring benefits sharing, which we know is a challenge and that's why we are going to be working on this topic. Um, so, uh, there were some questions related to the BS Clearinghouse uh, and it's how the GBF impact the BS Clearinghouse, which is a, a good question. Basically, um, many of the indicators that uh, Gillian showed before, uh, they they count with this publishing information on the BS Clearinghouse. So we hope that thanks to the GBF, <laughs> we will have more uh, um, countries will have all the information up to date um, and complete in the screen house. Besides, we don't stop repeating it, but besides being a key obligation uh, under the protocol, this is uh, very important um, for uh, the functioning of the ABS system and for users. So if you don't have enough excuses, also this helps you monitor the progress and showcase the progress uh, on, on the implementation of the GBF and the target. Um, also, uh, new indicators, could be done through the BS Clearinghouse. This is a possibility. We will see. Uh, we will make always that the information provided at the BS Clearinghouse uh, shows up uh, in whatever the information system we have to follow information on the GBF and implementation on the GBF. So, um, yeah, next slide, uh, Farah, please. Um, OK, we have talked enough about MBSAPs, so I think this is going to be just like a little bit of a wrap up. Uh, how to capture DSI, Did, that we didn't answer, um, but as we say, the issues of DSI are still under consideration. Parties may wish to see what are the implications for countries when the decision is taken and incorporate that, um, that aspect later um, to the MBSAPs or to their policy or measures as, as needed. So as it is, it's unclear what are the implications at country level and at national level, so we that has to be considered later on. For the moment, it's just like a place caller. Um, for ABS, as we have said before as well, this is an opportunity to review the progress made and how to be more effective on the ABS systems and how we can improve. This could be done through legal reform. Sometimes maybe what your country needs is just maybe some extra stuff, Maybe you need some additional financial resources. So each country has to determine, also in terms of capacity building, to and set their national targets. Revision of MBSAPs gives the opportunity to countries, together with IPLCs and relevant stakeholders, to take a stock of ABS implementation across different international instruments and envision the future of ABS for the country. So it's a key process. Uh, it's a good opportunity to, to take make it right from the beginning. Here, yeah, uh, there was some questions about the global multilateral benefit sharing mechanism and what is the status. So um, for this is a very brief answer. In the last meeting of COPMOP, Consider the issue on the basis of a recommendation by SBI and in decision MP4 slash 10 decided to revisit the issue of Article 10 at its fifth meeting. Given that there is ongoing negotiations on DSI, they decided not to 
continue considering for the moment the global multilateral benefit sharing mechanism until there is progress done on DSI and we can see how everything can work together. So easy answer. This is uh, at the moment is on, on a pause. The next um, slide, yeah. So um, this is how, yeah, yeah, about conservation and sustainable use. ABS was conceived as an equity issue, uh, first of all. Uh, given the development and growth of the biotechnology economy, when it was negotiated the CBD, it was considered that was a, um, was a fact of fairness and equity but also was uh, conceived as an incentive for conservation and sustainable use and as means to mobilize new resources for biodiversity. If you have benefits coming from uh, the biodiversity, they go back to biodiversity. So for the first question, uh, uh, well, I, what I was thinking more is like, I hope that nobody is relying on ABS to actually make sure that there is interest in biodiversity conservation. I think biodiversity conservation talks in itself, and there is enough arguments to 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 make us invest on this. Uh, but of course, the, there is an, a contribution. ABS can really contribute to equity, to to change the way that we operate, uh, to biodiversity conservation, sustainable development. Um, as we have been saying, after the adoption of the CBD two decades after, and I mean, ABS, everybody's talking about ABS now in the International Forum. Basically, it's not only the Nagoya Protocol, now it's in the BBNJ. We are talking about the WHO, uh, WIPO, is, is going across this idea of equity and fairness. Um, we can maybe do it better, maybe, but uh, the important part is that we don't lose sight of what we are trying to achieve, that is actually goal C. And as you can see, goal C is still very relevant and very important and has been at the core of the discussions of the GBF. So in conclusion, the intended impact. I mean, we need to make it happen all together. We bring equity to the table and we help biodiversity. And uh, to start doing this and kind of reset again, get this impetus and this um, boost that is the GBF and the new resources and and the media attention is to get this opportunity and get the NBSAP revision process right. And to make sure that your country is set in the right direction for the future for your country. And internationally, we will try also to continue moving. So we move in the, the same direction and there is the DSI discussions. There is COPMOB, so I encourage everybody to, to try to get this transformative change happen and, and yeah, make sure that we bring benefits that is like, yeah, that at the end of the day is our objective. So with that, I think this is the last slide, no? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, Farah? You're sharing? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so uh, we would like to keep you, I mean, we'll keep you posted of what is the next topic for the next um, webinar. As you know, this is happening every month. We also, I want to answer some of the questions that were related to um, what is that they would like to see this in written. Uh, yeah, uh, we are going to do frequently asked questions. That's our methodology after the webinar we will prepare some yeah some answers frequently asked questions on this and um, we will be sharing them with you as well as the recording of the webinar that will be available in the VSCAN house there has been some also some discussions about um, rent excess burden and some economical issues regarding DSI from uh, Joseph Bockel uh, unfortunately, uh, um, yeah, Joseph, sorry, we, I don't think we are going to be able to answer all these questions here. And a little bit like um, I haven't prepared to answer this and that's a little bit beyond topic. But um, yeah, we, we, we acknowledge that, yeah, um, that there is a lot of discussions happening in DSI and the DSI conversation is always around, but yeah, maybe not, not the right moment right now. Am I missing any other question that mm, is in the chat? Sorry. Oh. 
All good, Bea. No other questions. Okay. So with this, uh, yeah, I would like to wish you a good day. Continue working in your work, or and please um, reach out to us if you have any other questions. We will continue working, improving the guides, and there will be some work um, happening with them. And we will be here to support you. Anyone wants to do some other remarks? Gillian, do you want to? Okay. So with this. Have a good day, everybody.